Okay, welcome everybody to our October Aperio Microconference. I'm Wilma Hodges. I'm the Sakai Community Manager and I'm also a member of the Aperio Board. And I will be introducing our speaker today. Um, but before we get started, let me just make a couple of quick announcements. Um, one of them is um, the uh, Friends of Aperio membership drive. So right now um, we're doing kind of a, a membership drive through the end of the year. We're hoping to get a thousand new members and um, we, it's an individual membership essentially for Aperio. So if you join Friends of Aperio, you're not only supporting um, the Aperio Foundation, but you're supporting open source in higher ed. Um, and there are quite a lot of perks that go with it. Um, you will be helping to support microconferences like the one we're doing today. Um, and there are also a variety of um, professional development resources and memberships that you can take part in uh, because Imperio is a member. So things like Educause, you can join the listservs, you can, um, you know, do that sort of thing. Um, you can also uh, take part in other um, fundraisers and policy um, uh, activities. So we do hope that you will join. Um, membership is only $100 for individual professional members and for students it's only $25. So please keep that in mind and again we're hoping to um, encourage folks to register before the end of the calendar year to support our membership drive. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that Aperio will be at All Things Open this um, this year in Raleigh. That happens later this month at the end of October. Um, and uh, members of Aperio get a 20% discount on registration. So if you're in the Raleigh area and you're planning to attend, if you've not yet registered, you can use this link here. Um, and I'll, I'll paste this in the chat as well um, so that you can get to the, uh, the registration link um, page with the discount. So um, hopefully you'll attend. I hear lots of great things about All Things Open. Today's presentation is Invest in Open, the State of Open Infrastructure. And we're going to be finding out um, some key things related to the characteristics of selected open infrastructures, some of the sources and characteristics of grant funding for those infrastructures, and um, the influence of procur procurement and information technology governance on adoption. So um, and we'll also be getting a sneak peek of InfraFinder, IOI's open infrastructure discovery tool. Um, our speaker today is Emmy Sang, and she is passionate about open and meaningful community design, strategic communication, and sustainable and equitable innovation. Previously, she led the communication and community engagement efforts for the Open Science Program at the Delft University of Technology to widen researchers, teachers, staffs, and leadership's adoption of open science practices at the university. At eLife, she helped build a community of open source practitioners to advance the development of open source tools to change the ways research is shared, consumed, discovered, and evaluated. Emmy is also a co-director at Open Life Science, which runs a global cohort-based training and mentoring program to support individuals and stakeholders in research and becoming open science ambassadors. She holds a PhD in neuroscience from the European Molecular Biology Laboratory and the University of Heidelberg. Originally from Hong Kong, she now lives in Ulrich, uh, the, ne uh, the Netherlands, and she's on Twitter at MEFT. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Emmy. Thank you so much, Vilma, for the introduction and uh, to Aperio and to Jen for organizing this. Um, it's really great. A uh, pleasure to be with you all here today and to be able to um, share some of the highlights from our um, inaugural State of Open Infrastructure report, which came out in May this year. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to share some highlights from our inaugural State of Open Infrastructure report with you all and also to introduce you to our open infrastructure discovery tool that is called InfraFinder. Uh, my name is Emmy Tang, as um, Wilma has introduced, um, and I work for Invest in Open Infrastructure. Uh, we are a nonprofit initiative with mission to drive informed, strategic, and coordinated investment in and adoption of open infrastructure. And we do this in a few ways. 
Um, we do research, so we conduct research into questions and landscapes of open infrastructure to help guide strategies and action and, and um, to help the development of a shared agenda to make open infrastructure the default in research and scholarship. Um, and that research is the basis of today's call. Um, the resources that are presented in today's call are part of our data room, which is all about building evidence-based tools and products to help support decision makers and institutions and other places to adopt and develop and invest in open infrastructure. Um, we do have other two other main program lines of work, so strategic support, where we uh, take an applied and tailored approach to that research that we're doing to work with uh, partners to help them um, implement the research recommendations to further the adoption of infrastructure and build resilience and sustainability in the sector. Um, and we also run funding pilots, and that those are, again, research-driven, um, but the aim there is really to diversify the sources and mechanisms of funding for open infrastructure. So that's uh, a brief summary of IOI and what we do. Um, and if you would like to learn more about strategic support and funding pilots, you can ask me in the questions after this presentation or visit our website. Just a last um, sort of preamble before we go into the crux of the presentation, uh, I think it's good to start by sort of establishing what do we mean by open infrastructure here. And by open infrastructure, we're specifically talking about the shared research infrastructure that is needed to support open science. Now, I know it, in the Aperio community, you all think a lot about um, and are, uh, care a lot about open source educational or higher ed technologies. And I think there are a lot of parallels between some of the things that we are thinking about at Invest in Open or IOI uh, in terms of ha uh, sustainability and health and resilience of the open infrastructure for research and scholarship ecosystem. Um, that uh, we there's a lot that we can learn from each other and the, the approaches that we're taking to better understand the sort of opportunities and gaps in the space. Um, our focus is, as you can see on the slide here, on a narrower set of infrastructure. So really thinking about open source solution systems and supports that facilitate the creation and dissemination of open research content and data. Um, but again, I see, I think from our experience in engagement and conversations, um, we see a lot of synergies with the sort of way of thinking and approach with the uh, open source high, higher ed tech space. Um, and I'm curious uh, to learn more from your questions and discussions later. Uh, as mentioned, uh, this, this presentation is mainly about the 2024 State of Open Infrastructure Report that we released in May. And we're really eager to hear your thoughts on this first iteration of this report, which we hope will become an annual exercise that we do. Um, and your input here will directly influence what gets put into the next editions. So the reason we decided to build this report uh, is five. Diff there are five different objectives. Um, first is that we want to really raise the profile of open infrastructure as a community good and a sound choice for adoption. Um, we also want to eliminate patterns in funding and areas of needs in the sector. We want to establish a baseline of information which can then be updated annually. Um, we also see a lot of in selected topics of interest as we are engaging with various stakeholders in the space from adopters of infrastructures to funders and investors and the OI the open infrastructure communities themselves. So we want to be able to have a space to investigate that and share out the outputs that we find. Um, and also to really um, establish a shared understanding and identify a possible course of action to improve open infrastructure adoption and resourcing. Uh, long list of contributors here, really they've all done really, really important work to help make this report come to life and um, also just really grateful for our Sustaining Circle members and our funders. Um, I want to give a special shout out here to Gail Steinhardt who has really led the development of the 2024 report and also a lot of the work that I'm about to present is her work. So thank you Gail and um, I hope to be able to do the work justice. <laughs> So um, covering quite a few topics today, 
that I think uh, we chose these topics to put in front of you all because we think that these could be interesting um, areas to explore with this community in particular. And again, we would really welcome your questions and comments at the end. Um, we're going to start with the characteristics of 57 selected open infrastructures that we analyzed, followed by um, a grant funding analysis where we did an analysis of 416 million US dollars of grant funding for open infrastructure. And I'll share the key findings from there. And then last but not least, um, a little bit on high level on the influence of procurement and IT governance processes on the adoption of open infrastructure. We, as you can see on this list, also looked at a bunch of other topics that are really, really interesting. Um, we are running a set of ongoing community calls to sort of go around the different topics and to be able to give them the space uh, that they deserve and to go into more depth about those different sections. If you are interested, I'll go through at the end how you can join us in the future upcoming sessions. So characteristics of bracket selected open infrastructures. Um, I want to share a high level view of the characteristics of open infrastructures that are participating in our InfraFinder tool. Um, this is a tool where we really want to enable users to find, discover, and compare open infrastructures. And I'll also talk more about InfraFinder at the end. The reason, the, so the, the, the way that this data set uh, and the selected open infrastructures were, were kind of chosen here was that we um, started with a big long list of I think over 200 open infrastructures that we know of and have sort of gathered from other uh, mapping exercises and catalogs efforts in the cataloging efforts in the space. Um, from there, we built a list of 84 open infrastructures that were then invited to participate in the first round of data collection leading up to the launch of InfraFinder last April, um, and 57 of them responded. Um, so a little bit on the sort of inclusion, eligibility for inclusion in InfraFinder and thus in this data collection exercise. Um, we, the, an infrastructure is eligible for inclusion if it is fully operational and in use as a service, protocol, standard, or software in the academic research and publishing ecosystem, and plus that they have to meet one or more uh, eligibility criteria having to do with whether or not, for example, it is open source, free to use, whether they are enabling the open publication of content or and or is community governed. Um, we're hoping that as the data collection continues, as InfraFinder grows and the data set grows in diversity, size and geographical coverage, we'd be able to draw more varied and robust conclusions from the data set and to be able to continue to build that evidence base to demonstrate the distinctive characteristics of open infrastructure that makes them a sound strategic choice for supporting research and scholarship. Um, in terms of the characteristics that we chose to look at, a number of them are functional and technical, but there are also many that are more to do with the communities that are around the infrastructure that we think are really important for open infrastructure in particular. And we really believe that uh, this is building towards a holistic understanding of the characteristics of open infrastructure. Um, and this understanding can help potential adopters and funders in assessing the health of the open infrastructure community um, and get a sense of how well the open infrastructures will respond to their needs. The data, by the way, for this analysis is openly accessible and available for download. Um, we also have a dashboard that you can sort of go and play around with the data yourself. And I'm going to put those links into the chat. So um, a, a, an overview of the types of open infrastructures that are included in this data set. Um, as, on, as you can see on the previous slide, and I'm going to reemphasize here as well, the first 57 are primarily repository related infrastructures. Um, and this is reflected in the types of open infrastructures that you can see in the figure on the left. Um, so here you can see half of, more than half of the segments uh, on the pie in the, or the donut rather are all repository related. They're 
discovery systems, um, repositories, publishing systems, and services and others. Um, and for those open infrastructures where um, the availability of a hosted option is relevant, most of the time that option is available. So um, the green, the number, th the small seg segment, gre green segment there is uh, the the no no hosting services available uh, segment. So it's a is a small proportion. Um, I'm mentioning this because. Um, we've heard in the course of many of our conversations that uh, having hosted hosting uh, options is for an open solution can really help place adoption within reach for an organization or an institution. Um, in terms of business forms and governance, nonprofits dominate our data set. So since our criteria for open are fairly inclusive there are also some commercially operated open infrastructures but majority of them here are non-profit um, most of them have some form of community governance and this is particularly interesting for us as we see that some open infrastructures are being absorbed into or acquired by entities without any kind of community accountability so to say um, and we did, in a separate section of the report, dug further into the governance of open infrastructure. Um, if you would like to find out more about that, um, I encourage you to read the full report. One of the ways that open infrastructure can represent how they work and serve their user communities is by being transparent in their operations and policy and by making that information public. So in the data collection, we asked about several types of policies and practices and the open infrastructures perform well across all of them. So you can see here in the blue bars, um, code of conduct, DEI, the diversity, equity, inclusion statement, web accessibility, privacy policies, open data statements, and transparent pricing. Um, majority of the open infrastructures do have them implemented or available. Where the implementation appears lower, so for example, the orange in the bottom, uh, the bottom two bars, um, it's because they are just not applicable for the infrastructure, most, most of the other in, infrastructures that don't have those implemented and available, as you can see in the orange uh, part of the bars there. Open code repository, open APIs, and uh, technical documentation are also hallmarks of open infrastructure. Um, open product roadmaps are still slightly less common, but there are still more than 40 open infrastructures, so about two-thirds report having or planning on having one. So that's the general characteristics of the 57 open infrastructures that we uh, have data from. Um, and now we will be moving on to talk about the grant funding analysis that we did. And it is very much related to also the 57 infrastructures um, and I'll elaborate on that later. So this is not our first attempt of looking at, of looking at grant funding for open infrastructure. Uh, we have built an initial data set back in 2022, I wanna say. Um, so now we're sort of extending, updating that work. I think it's important to point out that there is no single comprehensive source of grant award data. Um, and we, in doing this analysis, really needed to establish a starting point and a scope because it is a huge amount of effort. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in this next slide. So um, we, in terms of scope, we started with those 57 uh, selected open infrastructures that I was talking about before because we know something about them. And we believe that by combining the knowledge and data that we've collected about them uh, for the characteristics part, uh, we, we can combine that with the funding analysis key findings to be able to deduce and, and, and discover more. Um, and we also started with a set of known funders in the space. Um, this is the funders are sort of selected and built upon the our first initial grants data set. Uh, and also uh, when we asked in the data collection process for InfraFinder about how open infrastructures are funded, um, and then prioritized the list a list from there. Um, we use a combination of funder reported data, so funder databases plus um, uh, there is a source 
there's a funding database, especially in uh, the European context called Open Air, which has been helpful for for uh, this analysis. Um, we then had to, you know, man basically more or less manually review the um, the grant data uh, by searching for the names of open infrastructures or the variants of the names of open infrastructures, the recipients, the title of those grants, um, and the abstract and this, uh, descrip uh, descriptions. Uh, reviewing all of that information for relevance for this analysis and deduplicate the um, any sort of duplicated duplicated uh, awards. Uh, we then also categorize the funded activities for an, an analysis um, later on based on what we read in the abstract. And this is a subjective process, I should say. Um, we, in some cases, we needed to do currency conversion to US dollars, which we then use as the sort of base currency for all of our analysis. Um, and we added additional information, for example, about the solution category. So what type of open infrastructure is the open infrastructure in question for each of the grants? This data set is also open uh, for a download uh, and additional exploration. Um, we also do have a dashboard where you can uh, play around with it, as well as a uh, recording from an earlier community call where um, Gail, who led this analysis, uh, had had a conversation with, with others about the findings and the sort of limitations and challenges when it comes to doing this work. So I strongly encourage you to also go watch that if you're interested in this um, grant funding analysis. Uh, it's really quite a deep and insightful conversation there. Um, very interesting. So an overview of um, the grant awards that we analyzed, even with the scoping that we did, I want to um, say that these are really not trivial sums. Uh, we analyzed grants awards that totals at uh, 460 million US dollars from 23 funders to 36 open infrastructures via 514 awards made over the time period 2000, year 2000 to 2024. Um, furthermore, we did additional sort of annotation and categorization of the awards into three sort of categories, actually four categories. Um, so uh, direct support where there is direct grant funding to support the development of maintenance of the open infrastructure, um, indirect support, which is where the open infrastructure is referenced in the award title or abstract, but the funding does not directly support the open infrastructure, though it may provide some indication on the open infrastructure's broader impact. Um, there is a small category called adoption support. Um, this is funding that supports the implementation of an instance of an open infrastructure at a local or community scale. And then the last category that's not shown here is unknown. These are basically awards that we are not able to classify this time. So I explained all that because uh, you need that information to understand this. Um, so this is the total funding available in the data set um, divided, categorized by uh, the four super categories. Um, so the columns in the previous table. Um, and you see here that there are more indirect awards than direct awards in our data set. And I will come back to this. In terms of direct support, uh, a lot of people are curious about, in terms of the 57 open infrastructures that we analyze, who are the top recipients of these direct support. Um, so you see here, and some of these names may be familiar to some of you and some, in some cases, not at all. But the main point here is that some infrastructures attract a few larger awards and some attract more numerous smaller awards. And some of them have managed to do both. So um, the counts table on the right is the number of awards that infrastructures have gotten versus the table on the left with the amounts that they've gotten in total. So you can see that the ones highlighted in yellow have sort of managed to do both larger awards and smaller awards, essentially. Um, 
And then more about the indirect category, just to illustrate, uh, so we, we subdivided that indirect support category into two major categories, which we are calling use and adjacent. Um, so starting with use, this is what we mean. These are examples of what we mean by use. So in the grant description or title, uh, these are some of the sentences that were uh, in those descriptions. So um, for example, top one results will be disseminated in peer reviewed publication and on archive.org. So archive.org is the um, open infrastructure in question. Um, and here the sentence suggests this, the uh, encouragement of the users to go use that open infrastructure. And so this award is then classified as um, in part of the indirect support category, um, but this use subcategory. Um, so the money goes, the award goes to not the open infrastructure in the text, but the users of the open infrastructure. This is in contrast with the adjacent award in the same indirect support category. Um, the adjacent awards are more substantive use than, for example, uploading something to a repository. It might be, for example, building new infrastructures on top of existing infrastructure or using an open infrastructure's corpus for research. So here you see, for example, um, the second example here, we're building a mobile app that transforms existing IIIF app compliant digitized archival materials. Uh, IIIF is then the, uh, the open infrastructure that is being built upon in this project. So we, we consider that a uh, indirect adjacent support here. In terms of indirect support that, and that, to that sums up use and adjacent cases, um, these are some of the open infrastructures that receive in our data set the highest amount of indirect support. Uh, I would first mention, caveat this by saying that we probably underestimated all of the intended uses, so all of the indir intended indirect supports, because a lot of the mentions are not in the abstract of the grant, but rather, for example, in the main project narrative or the data management and sharing plans of the grants, uh, because these infrastructures concern data sharing uh, and, and content sharing. Um, why is this analysis particularly interesting to us? Um, because the point of open infrastructures or any infrastructures in th that case is to be used, right? And while we see that use can lead to financial support and grant, su grant award support, it doesn't have to. Um, and we're quite curious about what this means for the sustainability of open infrastructure. So we do have another ongoing investigation at IOI looking at reasonable costs for en enabling public access to research publications and data uh, mandated by the Nelson memo. Um, and in our white paper from that investigation, we observed that where usage plays direct demands on the infrastructure in the cases where usage or other direct fees that scale with use are not charged, these uses actually may place the open infrastructure under increasing strain and potentially threaten their sustainability. So um, it's interesting to think about, like, is the grant mentioning the use of the OI, like, it, it is definitely signaling the impact of the open infrastructure, but it is telling us something or raising question around the sustainability, financial sustainability in particular of the infrastructure as well. Uh, in the interest of time, I might actually just skip over this. Um, this is another part that I would love to spend some time on, which is to think about to our analysis looking at um, the direct support by award category, which we annotated, and comparing that with the funding needs reported by open infrastructure when we collected the data from them. So we categorize the direct support grants by the kinds of activities that they support, and that's the donut chart on the left. Uh, we simultaneously asked the InfraFinder participating open infrastructures about their most pressing funding needs and applied the same categorization, and that's on the right. 
And so as you can see on the left, um, research and development basically uh, gets more funding, while on the, on the right, most infrastructure wanted operational funding. Um, what we can say, even with this relatively small data set, is that open infrastructures is quite likely to have an unmet need in terms of operational support. We are very well aware that grant funding is not all the funding and support that's available to open infrastructures. There are different sources and flows of revenue supporting open infrastructure, and we would very much like to have put the analysis of the grant award data into this bigger context. The challenge is the data. Um, so um, again, I pointed to that community call earlier, so I'm not going to go into the various challenges that we encounter trying to collect the funding data from various sources, including um, IRS 990 forms in the US, for example. Uh, but overall, the data is hard to collect and it's quite heterogeneous if you know the, the open infrastructure in question is not a standalone nonprofit in the US, for example. Um, and we'd love ideas on how we can expand the data set and analysis to provide a fuller picture of the sources and flows of revenue supporting open infrastructure, including the sources beyond grant funding. Okay, uh, last section that I want to give a very high level overview on um, in the State of Open Infrastructure Report 2024 is the section on influence of procurement and IT governance processes on the adoption of open infrastructure. Um, the motivation for doing this is really noticing that in higher education and research contexts, choosing among available technologies and services uh, potentially engages an institution's procurement and or information technology governance or IT governance processes. Um, so from our, from, you know, anecdotal cases, direct experience from our own team and work done by other organizations, uh, we start to wonder whether or not these processes may be supporting or hindering the adoption of open infrastructure. And so what we did for this uh, investigation is to conduct interviews. We interviewed 12 organizations, which is a mix of um, universities and consortia, library consortia in particular in the US, Canada, and Europe. Um, and we also reviewed as much documentation as we possibly can in, uh, in terms of business and procurement documentation, IT governance documentations, policies, proce procedures, checklists, etc. cetera. Um, I know I've already presented a lot of information, so I'm gonna keep this at a really high level if you are interested in finding more about this, uh, we will be hosting a community conversation to discuss the findings in this section in more detail. And Gail, uh, who led this research, would be able to go into much deeper details into this investigation during that call. So a quick definition on what we mean by IT governance and procurement. Um, these are all both uh, organizational processes and policies. IT governance help align IT decisions with uh, the organization's missions and needs. Uh, procurement help guide the selection and acquisition of goods and services to maximize cost effectiveness and efficiency. It's good to note that IT governance processes have a lot of consideration, have a lot of variations in the set that we considered and can be quite formal or quite informal, whereas procurement tends to generally be more formal and potentially more stringent. Um, some of the key findings that we have uncovered during our investigation, um, build versus buy is a critical decision point in the process of selecting technologies. Most interviewees preferred uh, buy over build, regardless of whether the technology in question is open or proprietary. Um, and But it's good to know that both buy and build come with its own set of challenges. So for example, if an institution or organization chooses to build, uh, it's often difficult to assess the total cost to install, configure, and sustain the solution over time. Whereas if uh, it chooses to buy, then there is a need for a distinctive skill set to manage the proposal process and implementation for a buy solution. In our interviews, we also heard a growing preference for vended solutions. So 
um, these are ser service providers or the availability of, availability of service providers that can provide, for example, hosting and or maintenance services for open source or proprietary infrastructure. Um, and vendor solutions are attractive because they relieve the organization of the burden of having to, in the long term, operate and sustain their locally run, often customized solutions. Um, we also note the emerging roles of consortia and networks in open infrastructure adoption. The consortia network can procure a service on its members' behalf, and this model leverages the econ ec economies of scale at every stage of the adoption and implementation, from negotiating to planning and implementing. And we have seen and heard a few examples of this happening in our, in our interviews. Um, interviewees also mentioned that um, to educate and encourage an organization's senior leadership to embrace open infrastructure, both on its merits and as a strategic priority, emerged as the single most important way to facilitate open source software adoption. Um, the shared understanding and articulation of priorities hmm, lessen the need to continually educate around the benefits of open and allow decision makers to focus on the functional characteristics and technologies um, of, techno of the technologies that are under consideration. Which nicely brings me to InfraFinder and why we built it. Um, so, and I'm gonna stop with slides in a moment to bring you straight to InfraFinder and do a live walkthrough. Uh, but wanted to first touch on why we built InfraFinder. So um, we heard in our user research and conversations that basically finding the right infrastructure is a really hard and slow process. Um, there's a lot of scattered information across various parts of infrastructure websites and, for example, user forums, etc. There are different requirements and needs for different institutions and stakeholders. And it's just really time consuming to pull together the comparisons to help either you know, leadership or management of the institution to identify the best options. So InfraFinder is here as a tool to help you discover the open infrastructures that meet your needs. Um, it provides up-to-date and verified information because we work really closely with the infrastructure services to keep the information in InfraFinder up-to-date. InfraFinder is basically displaying information in the centralized location. Um, and the information covers ex uh, many common areas of consideration for institutions and stakeholders. And we do have a comparison view, which I will show you in a minute, where you can compare for infrastructure services side by side with links to more detailed information. So heading to the demo, Let's see if this would work. All right. so. Um, you can follow along by going to InfraFinder, and I'm just typing this link directly into the chat as well, um, infrafinder.investinopen.org, and this is what you will see. Um, we currently, as I said, have 57 infrastructures. We are working on adding more infrastructures in the different um, solution categories. If you go into the one of these cards of a infrastructure, this one, for example, you will see that we have an overview of the infrastructure, its mission, some technical attributes, um, and community engagement mechanisms, policies and governance structures, and some additional information. And last but not least, the a section on its funding needs and funding sources. All of this, a lot of this information we have put into our filter on here on the left. So you can filter on these information. So for example, by filtering solutions by their solution category, by some of the open attributes that they uh, have or do not have, um, technical attributes, community engagement, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, um, I'm actually, I actually have the filter on here, so I'm just gonna go and clear that out. But let's say I would like to find all the um, repository services, uh, then click update results, and that will allow me to see all of the repository services that are currently in InfraFinder. 
Furthermore, we can also compare them. So if I'm looking to compare repository services, I can click, for example, I want to compare Open Science Frameworks, clicking compare here, we'll add it to the comparison. Um, and I want to do, let's say, knowledge commons and try it. And then if I click compare, here you will see that it gives you the side-by-side -side view with the different attributes and uh, information laid out side by side. Um, you can also quite easily share this by copying the link or using the shared options. So uh, really encourage you to explore in your own time um, the different features that we have here on InfraFinder, particularly some of these filters we actually just rolled out last week. Um, so I uh, would really love your feedback on whether or not they are useful for you. Um, yeah. And in terms of what is coming next, as I keep talking about them, uh, we are having monthly community conversations throughout 20, the rest of 2024. Um, we have a newsletter that will allow you to stay updated on when these sessions are happening and any new research that's coming out from this investigation. I will highlight that we are actually having one of these community discussions tomorrow. It will be on the regional policy development chapter of the report, um, talking about and looking at how uh, policy developments in Africa, Europe, US and Latin America influences the uh, investment in and adoption of open infrastructure. So if you are available and you're interested, I uh, would love to see you there. We also uh, would really, really love your feedback. Um, please share your ideas, thoughts, and questions and inspirations with us using our feedback forms. I'm gonna put all these links into the chat right now. There is a link to the State of Open Infrastructure feedback form and the for InfraFinder, if you would like to leave us feedback, we would really appreciate it. Currently, we have a in-app survey. So if you go to InfraFinder, um, you'll see this blue uh, sort of pop up on the bottom um, and click on there. And it's really, really a short survey uh, that we'd love to find out more about how, why you would want to use InfraFinder and what, you would, what improvements you would like to see. And last but not least, we are here to help we're here to help different stakeholders in the, in the ecosystem navigate the open infrastructure landscape through the strategic support program. So if you wanna find out more about it, please also visit our website. That's it from me. I have talked a lot and I'm very curious and eager to hear your feedback, questions and thoughts. Um, thank you so much for listening and following along. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emmy. That was very informative. Um, do any of the folks here uh, have questions for Emmy? You can feel free to type them into the chat, or if you would like, you can activate your microphone as well. If there's no questions, I also have questions for you all. Maybe I'll help start the, some of the discussions. Yeah, that might kick things off uh, nicely. So why don't you go ahead and ask your questions? <laughs> sure. Here they are. So um, pick your favorite. But yeah, I'm curious about some of the challenges around open source software adoption that yeah, for those of you who are at institution or have been at institutions um, that you are encountering or have encountered that you wish there is more research or visibility on. Um, and uh, related to that, in your experience, what are some of the things that are needed to advance open source software adoption at in institutions? Um, for those of you who are with um, open source, so, who are building or developing or maintaining open source software, um, what in your opinion is one thing that will really help with sustainability? So three questions um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Well, while, while folks are thinking, I'll just um, contribute a little bit of, from my experience. So I work for Longsight, um, which is a services provider for Sakai. So we, we provide you know, support and hosting around an open source product. And I know one thing that, that I find personally frustrating is a lot of times the RFPs that we get 
from institutions are really geared more towards a commercial solution. Um, and some of the questions, sometimes they're difficult for us to answer because um, yes, we're a vendor, but we're um, providing services around the product rather than providing the product itself. So um, can you make any recommendations for, you know, um, RFPs and maybe suggestions that would be helpful in that kind of situation? Yeah, that's that's really, really interesting to hear. Thanks for sharing that, Vilma. It's 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 something that like it's one of those things that we actually highlighted in the procurement section of the report because it was exactly flagged to us um, that the institutional procurement and processes tend to be geared towards commercial and proprietary solutions. Um, so <laughs> unfortunately, I don't really have a straightforward solution. We do recommend that, you know, for institutions um, or organizations who are looking like, you know, who are hoping to further or advance open values and are sort of mission aligned and values aligned in that way to really look at their procurement um, processes to identify where things like where the processes and policies may be hindering um, the uh, you know, open source solutions or vendors of those solutions to respond to those RFPs, essentially. Um, and we've also had conversations where, you know, folks were brainstorming, thinking about whether or not there are entities that can help specifically open solutions, basically respond to RFPs and answer those questions. So I'm curious to hear if you've heard of other ideas that have been floated around as well. And I feel like I've also worked in an institution where, um, we weren't able to procure an open solution because of the RFP process. Um, and so curious to hear, you know, what folks think may be a way forward from here. I see there is a question in the chat from Tillo. Hopefully I'm not mispronouncing your name. Should I read it, uh, Wilma? Oh, yeah, go ahead and read it off okay. so that it's included in the recording. Sure. I was wondering if you have or foresee any limits to what tools and services might be described in InfraFinder or is this generally open to all kinds of tools across the research life cycle? Um, I don't think there are, there the general eligib eligibility criteria which you can find on our InfraFinder's uh, site is that you um, have to be a tool in the research life cycle and satisfy one of the, I think, five uh, criteria that we, any one of the five criteria that we currently have um, for, for inclusion in InfraFinder. Um, we do want to prioritize, you know, open, open source solutions, solutions that are community governed, et cetera, et cetera, but it's not, you know, a, it, we want to really emphasize, and actually is one of the main points of InfraFinder, is that we want to emphasize that these things are not binaries, they're often spectrum, spectra. Uh, and um, yeah, they, I think we, it's, it's an ongoing learning exercise for us in terms of, as we are um, getting expressions of interest for, uh, for infrastructures to be included in InfraFinder, um, how we are thinking about the inclusion of infrastructures ourselves and how the community is thinking about it um, and so yeah there like in short what I would say is that if you are interested in being you know included in InfraFinder definitely don't hesitate uh, I'm going to put the link to actually the um, the expression of interest page that we have so you can go and have a look if you're curious um, and the uh, the more, you know, expressions of interest that we have, the more we can learn about sort of what's useful for the community uh, and how we are thinking about the inclusion in InfraFinder. Okay, so we have a question from Jen. To confirm the growing preference for vended solutions applies to both proprietary and open. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's generally the, the what we heard from the interviews, as far as I understand, is the, the preference for the vendor solutions. And it, it, it is regardless of whether the solution in question is open or proprietary. Um, I think the you could say that because we are investing in open infrastructure, when folks come to interviews with us, there is automatically a little bit of a bias when it comes to how they're thinking about um, um, infrastructures and technologies. Um, a slight preference for open, for example, is, is likely to be the case. 
Um, but yeah, the, 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 there are many advantages that we're hearing from our interviews in the broader community about you know, vendor solutions, primarily around the need to not have to maintain or just operate your own um, instance, your own installation being the, the main advantage there. Um, and we are, we are doing work to continuously explore how, you know, we can work with uh, vendors and solution providers to um, sort of advance the adoption by increasing the visibility of the work that they do, for example. So I do see a comment from Wes there. I'll go ahead and read it off for you. Um, in response to her question, I don't see any insight between those of us in the trenches doing open source and administrative entities um, making the, the purchase agreements. They don't really understand open and don't really ask us about it. Um, and Wes is coming from a medium-sized institute of about 600 undergrad, or sorry, 6,000 undergrads. Thank you very much, Wes. Yeah, that's, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's something that, um, again, going back to that point of it, just the, the advocacy element of this being so important, um, part of InfraFinder as we are, you know, as we launched it as a prototype and then go on to discover how people are using it, there's definitely feedback coming in to say that, you know, just because we put this catalog, this this tool together and sort of sh shown light on the 57 infrastructure is sort of bringing the, I don't want to use the word legitimacy, but the, you know, the visibility of open infrastructure and them as a viable option into light for the decision makers. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a long journey. And often, like, again, speaking from my own experience at institutions, it's really somehow managing to talk to the right person in those purchase, purchasing departments and entities who, you know, are somewhat curious about open and those people are so rare. Um, and, and they do, it does take a lot of time. Um, but yeah, it, Hopefully, you know, with more conversations around it, more people talking about it, and um, more also, you know, international entities like UNESCO with their open science recommendations, where they've explicitly laid out provisions around, you know, open science infrastructure um, that, you know, we can ask the people who are doing the advocacy work sort of leverage those uh, bigger pieces of international efforts and other things to sort of continue to push and 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 bring this in front of decision makers and leadership and management to advocate for for open infrastructure use and and um strengths okay and jen also asks uh, do you see requests for marketing of oi solutions as something that could get funding this is where proprietary has the upper hand on open source. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. I have to actually go back to the the pie. Let me see if I can go back to the pie and see if marketing, um, how big is marketing on here? I do think I remember. Uh, sorry. Here we go. Um, yeah, there's a little bit on community and a little bit on strategy, governance, and business planning. And I feel like marketing, I, I have to go and double check if we actually labeled that as a separate category. So, um, but again, like I think the, what, what from, from sort of remembering from, from the analysis and data, like anecdotally, it's one of those things that are not easy to get grant, especially not grant funding for specifically for around marketing. And it's absolutely true that is one area where, you know, the investment from commercial counterparts of infrastructure is just really completely, you know, out, outweigh completely, you know, it's just a lot more being invested in a commercial entity towards this sort of activities than most open infrastructures would, I would say. So, um, yeah, I, we have been, we have heard 
about this from multiple open infrastructures in our conversations and have been sort of thinking, toying around, exploring ideas around, you know, is there some sort of um, sort of shared marketing services that could be provided to open infrastructure so that open infrastructures don't have to individually bear the costs of operating their own marketing teams and departments. And I know that at Pirro, like looking at your the work that you all do, you all actually is something that you all provide. So we have been looking at the work that you all have been doing um, as, as a source of inspiration, if you will. Um, but just really recognizing that that's an area where um, it'd be really nice to be able to have more funding for uh, specifically. Um, and and yeah, and to be to be able to see how we can um, build it across the ecosystem so that it becomes something that is also sustainable in the long term. All right. Well, I think we are at the end of our hour. So um, so I want to um, thank you so much for sharing all of this information with um, the folks here today and with the bright, broader audience for the recording later. Um, I'm sure that uh, we can all take this information back and try to, you know, spread the awareness, which you've already made a great start of, you know, building here. So, um, so that's definitely a key takeaway for me is, um, is having yet another resource we can share with folks to, to um, show them, you know, what's available and hopefully um, connect the dots a little bit between um, open source uh, service providers um, and people looking for hosted services, as well as just kind of the, the awareness of open source sustainability and viability in general. So again, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all Thanks of you so who attended today. Um, Emmy, would you, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, just thank you so much for having me and I really enjoyed uh, sharing some of our insights with you all and look forward to, um, yeah, continue to interact with the Imperial community and, yeah, cheering you all on on the open source <laughs> advocacy journey. <laughs> all right, great. Well, thanks again and um, you guys have a great rest of your day.